Well, first of all, thanks everyone for joining. It's, it's great to see so many faces. And also online, I see there are uh, quite many. And uh, so yeah, this is uh, the first session of the new season of the 2023-2024 season of the FKI Machine Learning Coffee Seminar. And while well, it's coffee, it's a 2 p.m. And we got pizza as well. So, it's, so if someone wants to join in person, please come. We have a lot of pizza. And uh, so yeah, so from this year, the as you've seen from the program, uh, we have one meeting here in Kumpula, one meeting at Alto. We alternate every two weeks. And uh, we are really glad today for the, the first talk of the season to start with uh, Arto Klami's talk. Arto is an associate professor here at the Department of Computer Science of the University of Helsinki. And he's been also highly involved with FKI activities and the HIIT. And uh, we're going to learn, uh, this is a fantastic title, uh, that we have been promised at least better priors for everyone. And let's see what that's about. I definitely want better priors. So thanks, Arthur. Yeah. So thanks, Luigi, uh, for the introduction and the opportunity to talk here. I think I've actually covered half of my talk around four years ago. So if you were here back then, then you can kind of quit listening right now or just listen to the other half. So yeah, I, I'm uh, going to talk about the prior distributions. That is kind of an essential concept that I expect most of you know about, but that if you go through courses or scientific papers, people really don't pay that much attention into those. So like I said, I'm promising better priors for everyone, except that I have one exception. So not for you specifically. So it just means everyone else. Uh, so I'm mostly talking about works that have been done by, by others, so uh, both docs, collaborators, former PhD students, and so on. Uh, so the context here is that we're talking about Bayesian statistics, essentially. So we are in, within the Bayesian framework of modeling data. Uh, this slide is here mostly to just introduce some notation and, and color coding that I'm going to be uh, using. So we're building a model for some data, and I'm trying to more or less consistently denote data by blue color and X or D as a symbol. Uh, our model is going to have unknown parameters, the ones that we want to know, know about. Uh, and I try to use this purple color uh, for denoting the parameters. And then because we're building a statistical model, what it in practice means is that we are just defining a joint probability distribution over the data and the parameters. And I'm going to be conditioning that joint distribution on lambda, uh, which is denoted by a red color. Uh, and that is a variable that we are not being considering as a random method. It's simply something that we fix while we are specifying our model. So it's not parameter in the sense that it's, we're not worried about the uncertainty of that. It's just part of our model specification. Uh, and that's going to ultimately be the parameters of our prior distributions in most of the things that I talk. Once we've defined this model, that's when like much of the modeling work starts. starts. We're going to do inference, so we're going to figure out the posterior distribution, the distribution of the possible values our model parameters could take, conditional on whatever data we observed. During this talk, I'm not going to talk about this inference problem at all. I'm just assuming that we know how to do inference. It's going to be Marco Chain Monte Carlo. It could be various other approximation, or it could be anything. It's just kind of a given. We will be focusing on the point part where we specify the model. Here on the right, we have a, an example, a plate diagram description of a particular model where we have some observed data. Uh, we have some parameters, these hollow nodes, and then we have these boxes that are our fixed parameters, the lambda, that control somehow the prior distributions we assume on these random variables. Anyone in the audience who can immediately shout what kind of a model this is? No, just shout. It's some, some sort of a mixture model. So a Gaussian mixture model, most likely. There's some parameters that look like means and covariances and so on. 
In the context of this, so what we are now going to talk about is really the choice of the prior distributions. So what do we assume about the random variables before seeing any of the data? And I want to start by reminding that this is simply part of the model specification. It's not something that you should do at the end of the modeling pipeline. It's more or less as important as every other choice you make when building a model. Be it whatever choice of likelihood, or for example, the structure of a neural network architecture, if you're doing Bayesian inference for those. And when I talk about choice of priors, there's kind of essentially two elements to that. One is, what is the distributional family that, my, that I assume for my priors, whether it's like a normal distribution or a gamma? And then there is the choice of which specific instance in that family. So whether it's like, like a normal distribution with mean five and variance seven. I'm mostly going to be talking about, well, actually completely only to be talking about the latter one. So how do we choose the parameters conditional that we've already decided that this is our functional family? We could be talking also about the choice of the family, but let's leave it for another day. Uh, and here, just kind of as a reminder, so the, the lambda I'm going to use to denote the parameters of the prior distribution. But from the perspective of the whole modeling challenge are kind of like hyperparameters. I need to fix them in advance, then I can do the rest. Uh, and why I said for everyone, I essentially mean that for two different communities. So I'm going to be spending roughly half of the talk talking about let's say classical statistical models. It could be something like a model for how the pandemic progressed uh, during the, when, when we had that. And typically, if we simplify enough, so these kind of models usually have relatively few parameters. They have some physical meaning, for instance, what is the transmission coefficient and so on. They may have rather complicated set of hyperparameters. You may have possibly multivariate priors you may have separate prior for each of your parameters and so on. And you would usually implement them with something like STAN, at least if you are kind of a modern statistician. And the choice of the priors is that if you read a textbook, it just says, here you put your domain knowledge into this prior. So you encode everything you know about this problem and you put it into the prior. And then we have the other side of the slide, which is like the machine learning community we're using the same tools of Bayesian statistics. We're doing using similar inference algorithms, but we're working with models that are very different. You may have millions, possibly billions of parameters. You would usually only have very few hyperparameters. If it's, let's say, a neural network, you would probably assume the same prior distribution for every single weight in that neural network, and it just has one or two parameters. You would implement it in a PyTorch or something, and what you actually try to achieve with the priors is rather different as well. You don't believe you have a domain knowledge on what is the distribution of weights for a neural network, but rather you want to achieve a specific property for your model. Maybe you want to encourage sparsity, maybe you just want good predictive accuracy. And how you would choose them then is that you would just essentially do cross-validation of some kind. You try out lots of very different values and you choose whatever works the best. Or if you're a bit lazy, you just go with the default value. So I'm going to be talking about both of these, trying to use the same color coding. I just realized now that this uh, beamer here in the lecture hall shows colors very poorly, so this is not going to be very helpful. It's brown and blue, but you can't really even see it. Uh, so let's start working about the, with the statistical models. So I'm going to just mention but building a statistical model, designing a model is actually rather hard. That's what statisticians do for a living. So you start modeling something and it takes maybe six or nine months for you to build a model for that. And it's a highly iterative process. So you keep on revising your model all the time. There's been attempts of making it systematic like this Bayesian workflow. Uh, and why I'm only kind of showing it here to illustrate that how complicated a process it is uh, and to point out that we are actually going to be thinking about the priors multiple times during the design process. So they are actually quite big part of this whole design process is to talking about the priors. And the problem in specifying priors is that people just say, put your domain knowledge there. But this is actually really, really hard. 
especially if you're not a statistician, you're maybe a medical doctor, you have some idea of how this disease works or, or whatever. But if I ask you to, that there's going to be a viable prior on this and that parameter that interacts with this other parameter, what should the values be? There's literally no chance a medical doctor would be able to do that. So there's going to be usually a separate statistician that needs to work on this model and somehow figure out how to convert the medical doctor's ideas there. So it's hard. Uh, but let's then take a look at something that is slightly simpler. So an example where we can really talk about what's the effect of the prior. So here's a simple example where I'm going to sell ice cream. I'm modeling X, the amount of ice cream I sell per day. T is a covariate that is the temperature, outside temperature. And I'm just going to be able to make this simple model that I'm, well, it's a positive re can, can, can integer quantity, so I model in this Poisson, where the rate depends linearly on the temperature. And I believe that if the temperature goes up, the coefficient is going to be positive. So I'm putting gamma priors on this intercept and coefficient. And now the question is, what's the effect of changing these red numbers here? That's where we choose the prior. Uh, and there's actually three different levels of thinking about how to do this. The first one is that I just look at my problem and I just say, I'll type in a nice number. I just say that the second parameter for the beta should be 1.5. This is how people classically design statistical models. You type hard magic constant there. Uh, the other option is that I may have some sort of subjective knowledge on the parameters. What do I expect my parameters to look like? Uh, maybe the coefficient of how many extra ice creams I sell, if the temperature is one degree higher, I know that it should be around three, three to six. That's my subjective knowledge. Or I could alternatively have subjective knowledge on the data itself. If it's a nice weather, I usually sell around this many ice creams. There is a difference between these two. This is just me knowing something about how does the data look like. I don't need to be a statistician to understand anything. The middle one already kind of requires me to know what was the assumed model we had. If you think about these three levels, there's kind of an uh, argument that, OK, directly typing the parameters, it's hard for a human. But it's quite easy, of course, from a perspective of an algorithm. We don't need to do anything. We already have the prior. When we go down here, it arguably becomes easier for me to specify this domain knowledge that I have. But we now introduce the computational problem. That is, let's say, here it's usually fairly simple. I just need to convert what would be the parameters for a gamma distribution that result in this kind of values. Here, I need to somehow account also for the model itself. So what was the assumed model and what would it result? So this is the scope of where we are playing around. So, um, And the latter two options, so options where I don't specific, specify directly the parameters, are effectively a form of prior elicitation. So it's a technique where the goal is to define a valid proper, reasonable uh, prior distribution that matches the domain knowledge of the person without asking them to directly specify it with some sort of a computational algorithm. So how we usually then do this is that we have something like a graphical interface where we ask an expert, not usually not a statistician, but like a medical doctor, to provide whatever information they have, either on the parameters or the data. Then we have an algorithm that converts that information into the hyperparameters. And usually these are in some way iterative algorithms. There is a broad family of actual techniques you could use here. For example, you can ask information about their beliefs in very different ways. You can either ask them to like draw a probability distribution, or you could, for example, show them two instances and ask which one would you think is more likely. There's a broad literature on that, 
I'm going to skip that today, mostly. But I am going to talk about this, whether we should be asking questions about the parameters or the data. So this concrete example is, uh, is from a software library called Previs. Uh, so even the question of whether we should be asking about parameters or data is an old one from uh, 80s or 90s, depends a bit on how you count. Uh, and there is a general argument that I tend to believe that experts usually know more about the observed data. Not always, but in general cases. In many cases, your models have parameters that don't really even have an intuition. They don't have a specific meaning. So it's very hard to ask a non-statistician that what should the value of this parameter be. In our ice cream selling example, both parameters have a meaning and you might be able to do it. And sometimes it's almost the same as actually asking if it's, let's say, a mean and variance of a normal distribution prior if you ask them to define the prior, you already pretty much ask them to tell the hyperparameters directly. But in the ice cream example, even if the person has absolutely no idea what statistical modeling is, they will be able to answer a question. Like how many ice creams do you expect to sell if it's raining heavy? But we do need to solve a harder computational task. Uh, and next, I'm going to talk about a bit about what do we need to do then. So if we ask questions about the observed data, we need some machinery to play around with that. Here is something called the prior predictive distribution. Looks a lot like marginal likelihood. It's not exactly the same thing, but let's not get there now. It's a distribution of over the possible data instances that we might be getting if we integrate out the actual model parameters. So before seeing any data, under the current prior, what do we expect from the data? And this is something that is frequently used as one of the early stages of the Bayesian workflow, which is the prior predictive check. The basic idea is that once you've defined a prior and a model, you can sample data from your prior predictive distribution, just look at it, and if it looks horrible, you know that your prior is wrong. Let's say if you're modeling ice cream sales and your prior predictive distribution says you might sell 5 billion ice creams tomorrow, we kind of know, yeah, that's not going to go. And it's not if it says minus 20 ice creams, that's also not very good. So this is like a, something that people do routinely, manually when building these models. What we want to do instead is automate this process in some sense. So we ask the expert, what do you know about your data? They yes. ask them to specify in using any sort of a technique, what do they know about the data? Then we take a look at our specific model. For any given choice of the hyperparameters, the, prior, the current prior and the model defines some prior predictive distribution. Then the only thing we need to do is kind of fix prop so, so that if we look at the prior predictive distribution, and then we look whatever information the expert gave, we can just solve what should lambda be such that they are more or less the same. So this is the basic principle of something called prior predictive elicitation. There's a couple of challenges here. We have a high dimensional integral here. Uh, we need to somehow define how do we compare these things and so on. But the basic idea is quite simple. Here's one concrete instance of that. That's a method uh, we did a couple of years ago, uh, which essentially just says that let's ask information from the expert for an arbitrary partitioning of our observation space. And let's consider the answers that the experts gives as noisy realizations of the prior predictive distribution and then solve an optimization. I'm not going to go into any of the technical details about how do we do this, but I'm going to show an example of how does it work in practice. So here's an example statistical model. It's a model of human male growth during their childhood. You may know or may not that when you're a baby, you grow very fast, then the growth slows down, and somewhere during the teenage years, you actually there is a growth spurt of some kind. We took one example of a concrete model for this from Lawless from 2011. 
It's a model that has six parameters, some of them with interpretation, some of them without. It has 12 parameters controlling the prior distributions for those. So 12 hyperparameters, six parameters, some sort of a viable distribution as a, as a likelihood and gamma and log normal priors. It's a fairly simple statistical model as those go, but it still has a bit of a complexity. Then what we asked, we did a user study. Let's take a few statisticians and let them use two alternative prior elicitation interfaces to figure out the, the results. One is called structural, which actually means ask questions about the parameters themselves. The other one is predictive, so ask questions about the data itself. The other results of what we get for a couple of the, the parameters when doing this, on a first glance, they look more or less the same. The people did say that they preferred the predictive elicitation, so it was more natural and convenient for them to use, but the results are fairly similar looking with some, some exceptions. But if you take a more careful look at those, the ones that they elicited with the classical structural approach are absolutely horrid. So here on the left, we have an illustration where we have the real growths, and then the blue line is the mean of the, the prior predictive distribution when they were using the predictive elicitation on the right with the classical one. And if we kind of map it to this, this is like a prior predictive check result. If you look at those results, so it's saying that until age year eight, human males are on average negative length. So they're minus a few centimeters tall. So essentially, even if you carefully try to follow this kind of a procedure of figuring out good priors, you completely mess these up. If you then proceed to do posterior analysis, your results are going to be rather bad for the divorce solution. So it certainly helps to work in the predictive space. Uh, we continue a bit further on this. So I'm just putting here a highlight on something you might want to read if you're interested in this. So Petrus, the first author, happens to be here in the audience. He can tell you a lot more about the paper. So this is essentially a review on the current state of prior elicitation. Maybe now this is the right time for to ask, let's say from the audience physically present here, that who of you have heard about prior elicitation before? Quite many of you who have used prior elicitation techniques before. Oh, we have one. That's that's the first time ever I've given this kind of a talk, and there is someone who has actually done prior elicitation. And that's not a surprise. I mean, one of our main findings of this survey was that people are not using this. And we tried to explore the reasons why. So the one very common and very easily spotted problem is that. Much of the literature has focused on creating prior elicitation algorithms that only work for limited model families, like linear models or something. If you have a new model, there is nothing available. The other problem is that even if you do have, there's not proper software that integrates with the tools we today use for model. There are nice graphical interfaces <laughs> for eliciting the information from the expert but if you're building your model as like a probabilistic programming stand, you can't just say, let's now fire an interface that elicits the priors for my current model. It just don't exist. And finally, it actually appears that there are no good examples of anyone ever using prior elicitation for very useful problems. And there's two reasons for that. So it's a bit of a kind of a circular reasoning here. We don't have the tools. So it makes it very hard to do prior elicitation. And the other, other argument is that if you are doing the most important scientific discovery of your life, you are writing your nature or science paper on this. You don't want to take a risk of using more or less functioning prior elicitation technique for your model. Rather, you hire a statistician and let them spend nine months figuring out the priors. You want to play it safe. Uh, so people are then not doing it really. So what we need to do is, of course, break this problem. So if we did have slightly better tools, we are lowering the threshold of making it easier for people to demonstrate. They take them into use. Someone somewhere there will find this one case 
where hiring a statistician for nine months to figure out the prior is not going to be enough. You need to do it often enough and so on. And once we have come a couple of these examples, it of course makes it much more important for people to develop even better algorithms and tools. So we can kickstart, but needs a bit of a pushing. Here's an example of us doing a bit of pushing. So we are, uh, especially Osvaldo Martin is leading this activity of creating a software library that could then easily hide several practical algorithms and it's designed to be integrate well with the progressive programming systems and has like general purpose visualization tools. But we don't still yet really have those good solutions in general. Then let's switch to talking about the machine learning side. Uh, the, model, the modeling principles are the same, but like I said, the models are very different. There's no subjective domain to be used. We have a few hyperparameters, possibly millions of parameters. What we then do is that we have a couple of alternatives of what you can easily do. The lazy people just use default values, whatever was written in the paper, and you just put that there. Slightly more clever, let's say engineer oriented people just say, let's do cross validation. I try out 100 different lambdas and see which one works the best. Maybe I use a Bayesian optimization technique to select my cases to try cleverly, but still ultimately I just want to do it 50 or 100 times. And then there's a final third solution that I need to mention is this maximizing marginal likelihood which is really that I properly integrate out my parameters and really just maximize the likelihood of my data uh, given that. There's a couple of problems with these. Well, they are all ultimately either bad or not available. The first one is simply bad. So that's not scientific by any means. The second one does work, but if the, the posterior inference is the computationally costly part of a model, you have a large data, it may take a week for you to do inference. You don't want to do that 100 times if you can avoid it. The last one would be great. Gaussian processes with marginal uh, uh, conjugate priors, you can do it and you should do it. But that's pretty much it. There are very few models for which margin, maximizing marginal likelihood explicitly is technically possible. So we need something else. Uh, and what we set out was to create an algorithm for automatically selecting good priors for a machine learning model, or automatically selecting the hyperparameters of a machine learning model SS. We're looking at the same prior predictive distribution that we used in the prior station side, and we want to use this as the basis of really sidestepping completely the choice of hyperparameter optimization. We demonstrated in this similar paper uh, that came out earlier this year in the context of matrix factorization models, but some of the te te techniques do generalize to some other model families as well. And the basic core assumption that we want to avoid repeated inference. So that's really the kind of starting point. So the basic approach is that we can't, we started by assuming that we can't compute the marginal likelihood itself. But we can possibly compute statistics of the marginal likelihood. So let's choose a few of them, like mean and variance of our probability distribution. Let's choose a distance measure to compare things. And then what we want to do is we want to solve an optimization problem of choosing such a lambda that the mean and variance of our probability distribution are the same as the mean and variance of our observed data. We're not maximizing the likelihood, marginal likelihood of the data, we're just matching some moments here. Some people could claim that this is a bit of a cheating. We are looking at our data to specify our prior. I have a strong counter argument against that. We're not really looking at our data, we are looking at mean and variance of our data. It's very, very limited amount of information that we are using. We can also not use them. There are kind of properly justified ways I can talk about those later if needed. So ultimately, here's an example of what we, what we did. So let's look at matrix factorization. You have a data matrix of how many times a user listened to a particular song in Spotify or something like this. It's count valued here. 
and you want to learn low dimensional latent representations, both for the users and the songs, such that their inner product models somehow the rate of the, of the counts. So we have five hyperparameters here, controlling the kind of a means and variances of the entries in these latent representations, and then the dimensionality of the representation. And then we have possibly millions of parameters because they might have a very large data. Uh, we propose two practical algorithms for doing it. The first one uh, relies on human labor. So we have for Poisson matrix factorization, for that specific model, without assuming conjugate priors, we can derive means, variances, and certain correlations of the prior predictive distribution analytically in closed form. Hence, this optimization problem is quite trivial. We can just set the values of the hyperparameters such that these analytically derived prior predictive statistics match those of the data. Uh, here's some example results that Eliezer did for this Poisson matrix factorization. Some of them are quite easy. The expected value of an entry in that matrix, I trust many of you in the audience would be able to do this given a bit of time, could be part of a coursework. Some of them get a bit more tedious, but ultimately what we get as a result of this, that we get, for example, an equation that just tells the optimal dimensionality of your latent representation is this, where you just plug in some simple statistics computed from the data. That's been a, like in a matrix factorization literature, choosing the dimensionality of the representation is one of the major challenges that you need to do. And usually people resort to cross validation. If your more data actually follows your model, this works perfectly. So you get, if you simulate data from this assumed model with 200 components and estimate, you get the same 200 out. If it doesn't, so if there is a model mismatch, it of course starts breaking down. There's much more detailed analysis on that in the, in the paper. It does work with reasonable model mismatch. Uh, what we wanna do with this is of course, we started by saying that we want to choose good priors without doing repeated inference. So if we are willing to sacrifice all the computation time, then of course, something like cross-validation over all possible alternatives will give you a better result. But like I said, it requires doing inference after every for every single consideration. So here on particular uh, real data, uh, some sort of last FM data, very small scale data, very efficient posterior approximation, we compared against doing Bayesian optimization. So cleverly choosing always the next option to try. On the y-axis, you have a predictive quality of the final solution. The important gist is that early on, the immediate solution that we get by just solving our analytic equations is way better than anything you can have. Even after one hour here, in a small scale problem where inference takes a few minutes, most of the time, we are better than whatever Bayesian optimization found here. Now, if your posterior inference took a week instead of five minutes, we would never be getting here, except by wasting huge amounts of parallel computation, but that's just stupid. Uh, and also, of course, if you're not happy with how good your initial analytic solution is, you could, of course, feed that as a starting point for the VO. So it's going to be very helpful in all practical cases. If we step outside the set of models for which we can analytically derive uh, the, the means and variances and so on, we need to do something else. So we also describe a, a stochastic gradient Monte Carlo approximation type of an algorithm that explicitly minimizes the distance measure and so on. It's no longer immediate, but it still converges in something like one to one to 10 seconds. Whereas each round of posterior inference here took five minutes or so. So it's practically instantaneous, even if you are kind of needing to go for general models. So in summary, so I promised that the priors for everyone, I actually only described principles of finding better priors, but I hope I covered everyone. So all of you are statisticians or machine learning researchers, hopefully. So for the statistical models, 
I argue that it's near impossible for most domain experts to specify the priors. It really is challenging. Prior elicitation in principle helps a lot, especially if you do it in the data space. But the problem is that there's no off the self nice, robust algorithms you could use with arbitrary probabilistic programs. Hopefully in five years, there will be, maybe in two years, I don't know how fast Petros and others are in creating those. Uh, on the machine learning side, we still need to play around with the same priors, but it's a very different concept. It's worth thinking about them from different perspectives. Here we tried automatically selecting the priors, skipping all sorts of cross-validation and posterior inference. Works perfectly well for our chosen model, but requires, as it now is, quite a bit of model-specific derivations, but we are working, working on that to make it like more general so that you could more easily change the models that you're assuming and things that would also work in high dimensional output spaces. So as the final take home message, so if you really want prior elicitation ever to work, I have two alternatives for you. Either you can work on better robust methods and open software for them, or you can just use one of them. These techniques in your next nature or science paper, which will then encourage others to do the algorithms. Thanks. Perfect timing. Thanks, Joe. Yes. Yeah, thanks, it was very, really, really interesting. So we have uh, five to 10 minutes for questions. Anybody has any questions? Otherwise, I can break the ice. I actually have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's super interesting work. And, and uh, so, yeah, about the, the barrier. So I wonder, if, for example, you know, knowing a lot of the users in the, so I've been trying to push, you know, people in, a, for example, in neuroscience, computational neuroscience, to use Bayesian methods, even just that. And of course, I say, many people say are skeptical about, you know, we're still talking about the old problem of, you know, okay, how do we select the prior? We want the prior to be objective. And they're very scared about the idea that, you know, they are selecting the prior actually just by, by looking at something, uh, even if it follows an algorithm. So let's say, so the, have you ever encountered that? And how would you? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I this, this is a very good, good point. So, yeah, so the ultimate problem being that it's hard to convince people to use, let's say, good prior elicitation techniques if we can't even convince them to use Bayesian modeling principles in the first place. Uh, I would say that this is part of the solution. So they may, some people find probably the Bayesian perspective difficult to kind of accept exactly because the, the choice of the prior remains so subjective. So even if you have your like domain knowledge, you don't know how to describe it there. If there was, an excellent algorithm that when you ever you encode your knowledge, you see that it's actually reflected in the model in the way you intend it to. Then you might be more willing to accept that, okay, now I at least have a tool that allows me to do it. You might still need to convince some of them to believe that this is a good idea to do it. But I, I kind of believe that it would be easier to convince them that the priors need to be there, they're part of the model. Uh, and that you can use them. I mean, objective priors don't make any sense. Every prior would need to be one that encodes some knowledge. Mm -hmm. It prefers one type of solution over the other, or it explicitly somehow tries to be very vague about it. And, and if you kind of had a way of converting your real beliefs into priors that matched it so that you could see it in action, mm -hmm. I think that maybe helps a bit. Yeah, so just just as a, a quick follow up, because to say the problem sometimes, especially in science, is that you know you're trying to prove an hypothesis, and the risk is that of course it's say the prior it contains your hypothesis in some sense. Yeah. You know, say, so people are afraid. I mean, maybe that is yeah. that they would put the prior in such a way that would favor their hypothesis. Yeah. yeah, but let's say proving hypothesis purely based on data is not very sensible anyway. But yeah, I think yeah, it's I I do understand that that kind of a barrier there. But even there, in having the tools that, for example, allow proving that it doesn't mm -hmm. yet characterize the hypothesis there. So essentially, for example, simply showing the prior predictive distribution that you can see that under my prior, yeah. 
I still both hypotheses are, for example, equally likely in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I might add here one sentence like you didn't counter evidence for uh, your prior is not completely like rubbish, then uh, it will diagonal much the truth of the other. We didn't counter evidence your prior beliefs. No, no, Mr. Rosso, I'm going to be just me. <laughs> it will, but then even then you would want to be kind of as might be know a bit more about how fast this, yeah. for example, yes. happens. But yes, it certainly is. There is a question from the public. There are two questions in the chat on the yeah. online. Uh, if you want, I can read it. You can read it out. I, I also read it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would you, would you say that uh, successful prior predictive check implies that both structural and predictive prior would be equivalent? Uh, in simple enough cases, yes. So I, I think that, yeah, if you do any sort of way of specifying the prior and then you are happy with the prior predictive check afterwards, then yes, you probably arrived at more or less the same prior, assuming it's identifiable. I think there could be several different priors that all lead to the same prior predictive distribution. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, what you did then is that you manually tried to approximate something that directly matches, makes the prior predictive distribution good. So, but yes, probably yes, you can manually end up in the same same process result. Okay. So then the answer as well, have you thought of how your prior predictive match approach corresponds to an empirical priors and bootstrap? Uh, yes. Uh, so, so the empiric. Well, let's at least say that the. I would consider the the latter half of the talk. It's a special case of using empirical Bayes approach. It's a very like a specific formulation of that. So, in our paper, there is a I think two page related work section that very related to a couple of alternative, like like the good free inference and other things yeah. that also resemble this very much. And another question. In prior predictive elicitation, how does one choose the distribution for the prior? If you are opt using optimization, can you get the fit for whatever prior likely model you choose? How does one measure the suitability of the model or for the data for identity experts? Yeah, this is a very good question. So first of all, I've explicitly only been looking into the question of choosing the parameters given a fixed family of priors. There's nothing preventing, uh, I think I can think of two alternative ways of also choosing the family of the priors. So of course, one is that if you have a discrete set of possible families, you can just solve the problem for all of them and then pick whichever results in the best match with the, with the expert uh, feedback. Or the other alternative would be optimizing a non-parametric prior directly to match it. So there's some previous work on that, for example, Gaussian, price, Gaussian process priors, and, and we are also working on normalizing flows uh, related to that. Uh, yeah, for the last second half, I'm not quite sure <laughs> how, how to, I mean, at ultimate, at some point, we do bump into the problem of what we really even need with the model? How do you? How well does a model fit the data? I mean, it's a much broader question than than what we can probably address within the choice of the priors. Uh, yeah, there is an additional comment. I mean, I can read it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Default priors are also example of elicitation from an inner chooser. So elicitation is used every day. It's just a repetition of how to stay objective. There's a hesitance to use subjective priors, not prior elicitation per se. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is I I do agree that that uh, let's say default prior is an example. It is something that results in uh, uh, I I'm not sure I agree with the latter statement in a sense. There I think there is both of it. So there are people who accept uh, subjective priors but are still not willing to launch an elicitation interface because they are afraid that the interface elicitation tool is not going to do the job as well as that they would themselves do if they spend six months doing it. But yes, I, I do agree that there is a much of it is people that are still not willing to accept, accept subjective priors anyway. Yeah. 
Yep. So in the machine learning models, right, you have a lot of parameters, and then often you would rather see your prior as a regularizer. Yeah. So having a good prior, how do you choose it in, in such a setting where it should regularize more than being fitting the data beforehand? Yeah, I think that's that's ultimately what the this technique well. What it ultimately does. I mean, what we are here anyway, measuring maybe this is the best thing. So what we are here doing is we are measuring that once you've done posterior inference and you use it as a predictive model, you could pick whatever mean square error or predictive accuracy or something as the measure. And we are now kind of measuring that are we achieving a good solution from this perspective? So it doesn't actually take any stance on what the role of the prior is, as long as it results in a solution that ideally. And I think ultimately, yes, most of the priors would be if you let's say have a zero mean normal distribution as a prior and you are only optimizing for its variance, then ultimately you are choosing the amount of regularization. But you're choosing the amount of regularization such that your prior predictive distribution would look quite a bit like what your actual real data is. Um, um, just two other questions. Yeah, we're going to be able to quick. Uh, yeah, so first, uh, is there an advantage of using quantile versus a summary, statistic, summary of the data versus uh, the moments, as you show in here? Yeah. I'm not sure, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, let's say, uh, the basic pattern of matching some statistics <laughs> would apply for quantiles or means and variances and so on. Uh, there's two questions on how to choose them. So one aspect is what is easy to compute? Mean is analytic derivation of variance of a prior predictive distribution is maybe easier than quantiles. And then there is the other question that what is easier to elicit from an expert. And there may be, for example, quantiles actually probably are easier to elicit than variance. So it's a bit of a compromise on what we can ask and what we can compute. Uh, yeah, and so lastly asks, uh, what is the link between the models on priors, uh, the, model, the priors of models, sorry, and the priors of parameter of each of the models? Uh, I've only been looking at the priors over the parameters. Priors over models would more than relate to a choice of a, let's say, model choice. I, it's could possibly be viewed in the same perspective, but I haven't been looking into that at all. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks again, and let's take again in our book.